Uh, okay, so uh, I'm Lewis Lee. I'm a PhD student in transportation engineering at UC Berkeley. Um, and I am president, my background, I'm president of this organization that's really new. It's called Bud Lab, or the Visualizing Urban Data Idea Lab. It's a new student group that we have, and I'll talk about that. Uh, can I? This is not the latest version. Can I? Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah. So, um, so the Bud Lab is an organization that, that we started this year, uh, and some students from civil and environmental engineering and city planning, in order to teach data visualization skills to people that uh, would either be researchers or else practitioners, even if we don't teach them skills, if we just, I feel like just exposing them to the fact that all of this is out there is pretty valuable, especially because a lot of our people go out to be civil serv the kind of civil servants that might make decisions down the road about um, how much of the budget to invest in cleaning up the data and putting it on the internet or, or making the API um, well-defined or something. So that's sort of the purpose of the VUD Lab. We host speakers, uh, we provide some training, um, and we're still getting our legs, but if you're on the East Bay, uh, you should watch out for our events because they're open to the public. Uh, I was going to show you the VUD Lab homepage real quick because um, we got some cool stuff that you can check out. Like, we made these D3 workouts that have proven pretty popular as a way to hone your D3 skills. And what you do is, with these, you like look at a target like that, like you have like an image that you start out with, and then there's a video that um, Ian here made, and uh, there's an answer code and a setup code to try to get kind of get you going. And what you try to do is like code it completely from scratch, just like if you were learning uh, something on guitar, you might have like a little exercise, like you might do scales. That's the idea of those. So they've proven pretty popular. Uh, we were able. Uh, we're sponsored by an organization called Big Ideas at Berkeley. It's a good organization, and they sponsor a lot of different idea labs. And then we also were lucky enough that uh, for about six months of this year, I worked at a really good startup called Via Analytics that's at, in Berkeley, and they work in like this accelerator that we have called the Skydeck. We're going to have all of our events there, I think, or many of them, and it has a beautiful view. It's at the top of like the only tall building in Berkeley. So if it's another added incentive to come out to our hackathons or our speaking events if you hear about them. Uh, I wanted to show some photos from the hackathon. Uh, this is up at the Sky Deck, so obviously everybody's having a really good time. The Idea Lab's paid for our pizza, tons of pizza and drinks. Um, but most importantly, I think that what we accomplished was we got a lot of students at Berkeley, like grad students at Berkeley, people that are, might be full-time researchers, to come out and like mingle with people that would be professional programmers. Uh, and you know, we got some dialogue between the two of them, and I think that was pretty productive because some people learned about traffic flow theory, and other people learned about you know, how to run a server on your computer. So that was a pretty good event. And uh, it grew out of actually a conversation that I started with Ian. Ian here was our first speaker at the VUD Lab. Um, and he happened to live in Berkeley, so he came out and we started talking. He said, I got this, uh, I've got this BART data. And I said, I've got this big space. <laughs> Let's do something. And I've got a pizza budget. Let's use it. Uh, so, um, I started thinking about what I wanted to do, so I made this one called Stop to Stop, uh, which was, is, okay, so it looks like it's only going to show sort of in a column format here. Can I uh, zoom out a little bit? There we go. It kind of does it, right? Okay, basically the way that this works is that if you mouse over a, one of these things, uh, you can see like where the um, people that are getting on at that station where they're going to and where they're coming from, right? Like whether or not you click from or to. So I guess this is from. So you can kind of see like uh, Embarcadero is obviously the most popular one. All these big fat lines come into it from everywhere. It's taken up a big percentage. And then simultaneously, the circles on the left there, they resize. So you kind of see the same information in two different ways. One geographically, so you get that added dimension of like, oh, the ones that are farther away are going to have smaller circles. And uh, the circles are relative sizes. Um, and then you can do it vice versa over there. So um, I also, the, along before I started coding, I did motion graphics a lot. Uh, like that's After Effects. And we like to make everything bounce. So you can see that this is needlessly bouncing. There's like four transitions on there just to bounce nonstop. Um, yeah, but uh, one of the cool things about this was that uh, this, this is one that's more just about the BART system, right? But then I was able to tie in something about the BART strike by, I'd never written for Medium before, but I put a link on there. And then actually on Hacker News, a lot of people ended up 
you know, reading that. And then there was sort of traffic between the two, uh, between the two pieces, right? So sort of a, there's some synergy, synergy of one going on. Um, I actually was inspired to do this by Angela. Had already, Ian had already started a thing. And the first time I looked at this, like I guess I'm a sort of a professional academic that studies transportation. And everyone that I showed this to said the same thing that was in this field. It's like, oh, this is an OD matrix. And so uh, what we call uh, origin destination matrix, right? And normally it's presented in like a spreadsheet or else sometimes a map with a lot of lines on it that's really hard to read because the lines go over one another, right? And then, and then this one I love because it's interactive. It allows you to filter, because the problem with an OD matrix normally really is too much information, right? Like the lines are running over each other. What this does is that, and no matter how it's presented, because this is interactive and you can choose which one you want to look at, you can sort of shade all the other ones that they don't take up all the space in your mind. Uh, so th I was like, oh, I got to do that. So then I combined that, and I said, I'll just add the geographic element of it. And I used uh, some pretty cool tools uh, to be able to do that. Um, I was going to show you all what a normal OD matrix presentation would look like, which pre pretty much doesn't tell you anything. Um, but. Uh, I used uh, TopoJSON to do it. It's a place, it's like a way to, uh, that you can use in D3 to create maps that keeps the data really small, but also like you can read through a TopoJSON file and kind of see what's going on and put properties and features in. Uh, it was created by Mike Bostock, so um, there's a plugin that'll convert. Uh, if you use GDAL, if you use that library, uh, that, they'll convert between shapefile and you can choose what projections you want to do. I can't remember which one I did for this. Uh, but you can convert files into uh, into these topo JSON files, and they are just JSON files that you can, uh, you know, do whatever with. They're easy for you to read and play with. Uh, and then also, I use the uh, D3's chord layout. Obviously, this is uh, and the first OD matrix probably ever made with a chord layout. Um, this was made by Mike Bostock. And then um, I also use this really good library. I use Node uh, pretty much strictly, and uh, this is a really good. Uh, library for parsing like CSVs, your CSVs, and turn them into uh, JSON and play, mix them around. So uh, those are some of the tools that I thought I'd uh, point out that I was able to use. Is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Um, no, not especially. So now I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, visualization. I, go, I think it'd be boring if I went into the code of the visualization. So I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the way that we're using uh, D3 in transportation academia a little bit more, uh, kind of like what you've seen, but extension. So, for example, I made the, I made this for KQED. This will be on the they have a blog to teach math to middle schoolers this week. So this is like an illustration of how um, a traffic wave happens, right? So when I press this button, that one guy is going to hit his brakes a little bit. Oh, I make him hit the brakes a lot actually. But you can see we get a traffic jam on our uh, on our road. And you can kind of see how it evolves and mouse over them and see what their velocities are. And if you're like, oh, what are the particular dynamics of that? Like, why, why isn't it just one guy hitting the brakes? Like, why, why does that always have to cause this big wave? And uh, then I come down here, give a little explanation. And uh, now you can kind of see, here's some cars going along. The first car, the gray car, drops its speed really quickly. The other cars, they have a reaction time. And they can't uh, decelerate that fast. And once they do decelerate, it takes them a while to accelerate. If you notice the, the slope of the... Uh, deceleration is much steeper than the slope of the acceleration. So combining those facts, uh, what you get is that every consecutive car has to break to a lower and lower speed. And it kind of makes sense, like how just one guy, this is an extreme guy, like he goes from 40 to 28 instantly. But, if, but there's only nine cars, right? You get the idea that if the road is crowded, uh, then uh, it starts a traffic wave that eventually will make it stop, even when one guy just hits his brake slightly. Um, so this is just a good example to me of how we take like an insight from academia it actually would be really hard to explain to people. Like I was looking at a paper on this, and it's like, in short, this is the function for the acceleration. And it like gives like a function. So whoever wrote that paper thought that that was like a really good way to get the message across. Um, and uh, so yeah, and then we have some other, like some people that are uh, using things very much like mine. I guess he probably started out with the code. This is another guy that uh, is a PhD student at Berkeley next to me. And uh, he was able to use the same sort of format to show something about heavy-duty carbon emissions from trucks. Um, 
And then finally, I wanted to show uh, how we're, I've been actually able to incorporate D3 into my PhD research a lot. Uh, this is not going to make a lot of sense to you, but basically this is a, uh, these are cumulative graphs that kind of show how many cars are arriving at a toll booth at any time. And then I can turn on the tolls and I can try to, uh, to limit congestion. And you can kind of see how uh, the, you obviously don't know what's happening, but there's actually million, like tens of thousands of little agents that are making decisions in every uh, interval. And every like four milliseconds, I have them making decisions. So I'm actually able to look at sort of macro properties of the system that are being made by little, and it's agent-based modeling, tiny little agents. And people normally do this. This is not, this wasn't my idea. But they never get to see them in real time, right? Like typically, like let's say that you did this in uh, SciPy or with, uh, so pan like pandas or something, if you use Python, you'd probably just like print out, uh, wait till your equilibrium was done, and then you'd just like print out a PNG and pull it up or something like that. Or you'd look at one image at a time. But with, uh, with D3, I'm actually able to like dynamics of the system that change over time. And um, well, I hope that uh, that has given you an idea of what we're up to out at Berkeley and how D3 can be useful to you. Even This isn't even data, this is fake, this is a simulation. So you, no matter what kind of stuff you're doing, I think that D3 is valuable, and data visualization is very valuable. All right, thank you. <laughs>